Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who gives you the power to put True Crime Garage in your radio. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain. That's right, you true crime addicts. It's power hour. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring High Pines by the absolutely fantastic brewers creating magic over at Highland Brewing Company. Cheers to Eva and the Highland team. High Pines is a big IPA, not too bitter, a little sweet, medium bodied with fruit flavor that lingers on the palate garage grade four out of five bottle caps. And let's give some thanks and praise to our good garage friends. First up, cheers to Juanita. In Clarksburg, California. I want Nita beer. And a big we like your jib to Jennifer in Toronto. And here we have Anna, who's sending a big cheers from Denmark. And a big shout to Alicia in Schwartz Creek, Michigan. Next up, we have a shout to Wendy down in San Antonio, Texas. And last but certainly not least, we have a big Ron Swanson. Please and thank you to our friend Kathleen O in Laguna Nagil, California. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank you. Say it with me. B W E W R U N on beer run for everything true crime check out truecrimegarage.com also check out our bonus show off the record only on Stitcher Premium and that is enough of the business all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime later and no arrest in the Delphi case. As the days continue to pass on, we keep asking Indiana State Police, are they getting any closer to a break in this double homicide case? It's been four years since the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German, and still the voice of the suspected killer continues to haunt Delphi, Indiana. That audio clip of the killer's voice telling the girls to go down the hill was released by Indiana State Police. Investigators say Libby recorded the suspect's voice and snapped this photo on her cell phone before her young life was taken away. Tonight, the killer still on the run, being chased down by many of the investigators who've been out there since day one, like Carroll County Sheriff Toe Blesenby. It seems like it was just yesterday when we started this thing. 13-year-old Abby and 14-year-old Libby were out on a walk on the Delphi Historic Trails on February 13th of 2017, when investigators say they were approached by this man. The girls' bodies were found the next day in the woods about a mile off of the main trail. In 2019, Indiana State Police released an updated sketch of the suspect. That composite looked nothing like this previous sketch, which had been the face of the investigation for two years. It's like, wait a minute, now we got to start all over and we got to explain why they're doing what they're doing. They've obviously received enough information on the first sketch to realize that that person isn't the right one. Several agencies still working this investigation. All of them. We're having like a team weekly meeting in Delphi. The Carroll County Sheriff dedicated two detectives in his small department to follow up on leads. It's basic footwork, legwork, so to say, phone calls. What was this individual um, doing on February 13, 2017? You know, were they at work? Were they 
traveling. For the past four years, police have served search warrants, questioned persons of interest, and received thousands of tips. Still no arrest. We still have those up and down days, I guess is the easiest way to put it. The general statement across the board from law enforcement and the press is that there is no new news in the four-year-old Delphi murders case. And Captain, I say, we got to get rolling. We got to jump right in because no new news. Heck, we got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about here. First, it was announced that there would be no press conference on the 4th anniversary of the murders of Liberty German and Abigail Williams, the two middle school students who went for a hike on the Monon High Bridge Trail in 2017 and did not return alive. A questions about the case from both the local community and across the nation and beyond have been escalating for more than two years. So a few weeks ago, the local newspaper, the Carroll County Comet, ran the following. Readers invited to submit questions about double homicide. Carroll County Sheriff Tobe Lesenby agreed to answer questions solicited by the comment from readers and others. All right, Captain, let's dive right into this. I actually submitted some questions myself, hoping that they would be chosen and we might get some answers to these questions. So the questions... I sent in are as follows. First, I did a little butt kiss, and it, it always helps to do a little, uh, you know, grease the wheels a bit here. Well, it's better to do butt kissing than butt sniffing. There you go. So I started off by saying, Dear Sheriff Lesenby, thank you for your hard work and continued efforts on this very difficult case. I truly appreciate the dedication shown by you in the Carroll County Sheriff's Department. Now for the brilliant questions. Is there any reason to believe the killer had some kind of help or assistance? And is this making this difficult case even more complicated than normal? By help or assistance, specifically, I mean a second perpetrator or maybe someone who dropped the man off or picked him up. Or do you think someone is providing a false alibi? Well, and I also think people lean to the idea that there's two individuals because there's two sketches and they look so dramatically different from each other. Yes, and you've often heard me say that I believe that the bridge guy has some kind of help. I don't know what that is. And again, it could be someone unknowingly helping this guy or even willingly. The second question I submitted was, if the man on the bridge was totally alone, where do you think he parked his vehicle if a vehicle was used at all? Again, a great question, and this is something that law enforcement pointed out as one of the kind of their updates was they were looking for a vehicle. They never tell you the color, the make, or the model. They don't tell you if it's a sedan or if it's a truck, but there is a vehicle that they wanted people to come forward. If they saw it, I believe, on the 13th, uh, no update from law enforcement on that vehicle. I would have to go back to our previous Delphi murders shows, which we've done seven of them so far. The first was Delphi murders episodes one and two parts, one and two, I'm sorry, episodes 110 and 111. This is back from May, 2017. So we've been there since the beginning and we've continued to cover this case and look into it when something new comes out. And one of the great things about this case, about the true crime community and this case, is right from the beginning, people were promoting pictures that law enforcement put out, the sketches that they put out. Then we've had some updates, a big change two years after the murders when they released the new photos. But we've also had some big publications on this, a podcast that was pretty huge down the hill, and then just recently released around the four-year anniversary, the Down the Hill documentary on HLN. Yeah, we revisited the case in July of 2019, and this would be after that big press conference with the news updates when they changed to the new sketch and said the old sketch would now become secondary. 
it was during that news conference that they also released information about the vehicle that you just mentioned. I do believe there was some very brief and vague description. I would have to refer back to those episodes, but our first two episodes, there was really nothing as far as good information. The timeline was much shorter than what we now know it to be. So really, we were able to lay out a really good detailed timeline with much speculation in those later Delphi episodes, which again, we did four parts in July of 2019. So again, sticking with the vehicle idea, my third question is, is there still reason to believe that the vehicle previously mentioned in news releases is in fact involved or has that vehicle been cleared? As you said, Captain, they asked for tips about this vehicle. We've received no update as to if it's still information that they're even looking for at this point. Right. And in some interviews, I've seen law enforcement still state that they believe they're one tip away from solving this case. So without the long lead in, I'm now going to go through the questions that were selected and the answers provided to those questions by the sheriff in charge, Tobe Lesenby. Mm -hmm. The Carroll County comment starts off by saying there are five sections of questions to this story. That's pretty interesting. They broke them down into a few different sections to keep it nice and neat and easy to follow for the reader. And the five sections are as follows. Those specific to the double homicide case, questions concerning internal and external communications, questions about the crime scene and adjacent terrain, questions about the command center, and questions about the overall safety of Carroll County. The first question, Captain, is do you consider this a cold case and why? And Sheriff Tobe Lesenby responds, absolutely not. A true cold case provides no leads, no information to follow into. This is not the situation with the Abby and Libby investigation. Our investigators are still on a daily basis receiving information which can be looked into. In essence, the well has not gone dry, he says. Well, what's really interesting about the Down the Hill HLN documentary is when they talk about the early involvement with the FBI, how they didn't hesitate, they got him involved. At one point, the FBI agent said there was hundreds of agents working this case. Next question. How would this case be handled from the beginning had there not been any audio slash video of the person of interest? Answer. Obviously, we would have had to rely on other evidence gained from all sources. Is there any area that you can see? Like I just said, there was hundreds of FBI agents working in this case. Is there anything that sticks out at you that you would have done differently if you were in charge of the investigation? That's very difficult to answer because I don't know what information they know to be fact. Right. That that we are uncertain of stuff that's probably just been speculation and rumored about so far in this investigation. I did recall hearing Tobe Lesenby say, you know, he was asked one, of course he's asked this question here, but uh, he was asked a, a similar question, some different words involved, but very similar question. And one thing he did say was, you know, we called some dogs in some bloodhounds that were going to come in and help us search for the girls when they were still missing. Right. And he says, you know, if I could go back and do it again, what they did was when they found the girls, unfortunately they find them dead. When they found the girls, these dogs were being brought in from out of town, if not out of state, we called that off. And he says, if I could go back and change at least one thing, I would have changed that. I would have still let the dogs show up because maybe they could have provided a, a trail, maybe not necessarily to the killer, but at least the dogs may have been able to follow the killer and we might have been able to learn some of his movements or at the very least what way he, he left this area. Right. Because I, I think the difficult thing here is I don't think there's any clear going back over all the interviews, going back over different podcast episodes and the documentary. 
I don't think there's any clear definitive eyewitness that can say, I absolutely saw Bridge Man enter or leave the park. I think there's people that believe they saw Bridge Man, but then they say, ah, I think I saw Bridge Man, but he didn't have his jacket on at that point. So again, I think this is a big uh, misstep. And one of the things when you look at the crime scene, we know that this perpetrator took these victims down across the river to the other side. Did he come back across that river, leave the park entrance, or was his vehicle parked somewhere else, or did he leave on foot? And I think if you look at the two in the close proximity of the crime scene, there's multiple locations on that river that look like you can cross, like a, a bed of rocks or where it's just very low water and there's pebbles and stuff around. So I think the dogs would have a really good shot at keeping the scent of the perpetrator. And one thing that the sheriff is on record as saying is that, look, we have a lot of what he calls very good speculation about what direction and how the perpetrator would exit this area. But he said, it's just that it's just very good speculation. We do not right. know for certain how he left this area. Did one or more than one set of footprints lead searchers to the area where the girls were found? And Lazenby gives the following answer. This speaks to an evidentiary aspect of the investigation. And I would respectfully prefer not to answer. This is interesting because I, I don't know if you've seen this or heard this before about the potential of footprints that being from bridge guy and, or the victims or both that may have led the people looking for Libby and Abby to their bodies. I, I had not seen this speculation before. It's, it's certainly not out of bounds. It's something anybody would have thought of. I had always heard the rumor that, there was something that alerted one of the searchers and kind of got their attention. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they very quickly saw what they thought could be one of the victims. And then they, they walked in that direction and confirmed it was what they thought they were seeing. Well, what we do know is confirmed with law enforcement is like I said, the perpetrator took the victims across water. So even if the ground is hard and not leaving footprints around the water area, there could be some muddy spots. And if the perpetrator crossed that water multiple times, good possibility that somewhere he left a footprint. Is there partial DNA or a full DNA profile of the suspect? If there is DNA, has it been run against a genealogy DNA database? And his answer is very similar. This also speaks to evidentiary aspect of the investigation so he declines to answer however he is on record saying we do have dna now is it that of the killers we don't know yeah it's very difficult here there's a lot of rumblings online that i've heard that they do have dna i obviously can't confirm that but the other rumor that i hear is that this individual was at one of the searches and from people being at the search, they said, well, look, there was tons of people in the community searching. And what were they doing? They were smoking cigarettes. They were drinking bottled water, sodas, dipping. What do you say after every episode? Don't litter. Mm -hmm. These individuals were littering all over. So is it possible that from one of these items, they have DNA, but it's not actually at the crime scene? It's just with inside the park. Yeah. So let's take that a step further. I, I believe if I'm going to kind of read between the lines here, try to figure out what, what it is that he is saying or what it is that he isn't saying, uh, because these are two very different answers. When asked in person, he says, yes, we have DNA. We just don't know if it belongs to the killer or not. Keep in mind the questions we're going through here today. I believe that these questions were submitted to the sheriff, and he's able to sit down, read through them, and think very clearly. He doesn't have to think on the fly. He can right. pick and choose which ones he's going to answer, and that's why I think you get different answers at different times. When he's interviewed in person, he's a little more forthcoming, and I think it's because it shows his general nature. He wants to be a little more transparent. 
Mm-hmm. He wants his agency to be the, the heroes for this community. This community is in desperate need of a hero or heroes to find Bridge Guy and, and hold him responsible for this terrible act. What we have here, Captain, I, I have to look at his words and say, okay, well, what what does that mean as far as the DNA goes? Well, it means a few different things to me. One, the DNA has to be of a type that you can immediately go, I can't connect this to the killer because we've reviewed enough cases that there are certain types of DNA that if found, you know, the likelihood of it belonging to the killer is like 99% chance. Right. If, if we were to find semen in the direct area or of the victims or on the victims, Mm -hmm. you would expect that to be from the killer. If you found blood that didn't belong to the victims on the victims or near the victims, you would believe that that came from the killer. So I don't think we're talking about that type of DNA. I think we're probably working with either touch DNA Mm -hmm. or like you said, saliva or DNA that would have been transferred to an item that would have been discarded in the area. The problem with this doesn't necessarily have to be the searchers themselves. That certainly can add to it. But this is a this is outdoors. This is a public place. There right. could be beer bottles or cigarette butts or, or any type of debris that they could find someone's DNA on. They just don't know if it's related to that case, to to this double homicide. Was that debris discarded there on the day that the victims were killed? I think ultimately that's the crux of this case and the the downfall of this case is most cases don't get a spotlight. This one did. The evidence that they do have, they have to keep close to their chest, but they keep getting the spotlight. So they, they're trying to give the information out, but again, they have to keep things close to the chest. And I think that's because it's getting such a big spotlight. That's what leads to rumors, conspiracy theories, and, and a bunch of other stuff. The public has been given two sketches. Is the thought there is more than one person involved or is the second sketch the suspected killer? Please clarify the two sketches. This has been a point of confusion since the second sketch was released. And his answer is, these were produced by information gained from witnesses near the area during the time frame. The primary focus by investigators is on the second sketch. Well, and Kelsey, Libby's sister... I think three weeks ago in an interview that I was listening to, they were asking her about the second sketch. She never mentioned that they got it from eyewitnesses. She said law enforcement told her new technology is the reason why that there was a second sketch. And what a frustrating thing and maybe a misstep in this investigation to spend two years of your life doing nothing but promoting this picture to turn around and and try to go back to those same resources and outlets and say, oh, by the way, that picture is not correct. Here's the one that we want you to present to the public. And that's certainly a possibility, but I want to echo what what the sheriff is saying here, because that's been their stance from Jump Street. And it's been the, the, the stance of the sheriff's office as well as the Indiana State Police. Both agencies have always said that the second sketch was based off of witnesses that were near the area during the time frame. And they're really they're really honing in on the day that the the two girls went missing. And that's the information that they are very strong on and really looking for more information regarding that day, not as much the second day, the day that the two were found. The next question is was video collected throughout Delphi from February 13th, 2017, including video from the building across from the abandoned CPS building. Multiple pieces of evidence, including anything technologically based, have been gained. At least information followed into or brought to the attention by the investigators. At least information followed into or brought to the attention by the investigators is the second part of his answer, which seems a little bizarre to me. If you can get surveillance footage 
from anywhere surrounding the park, the bridge, those private properties, right? any way in and out. I'm hoping that they didn't just sit back and wait for people to bring that to their attention. The, <laughs> the investigators need to be out pounding on doors, pounding the pavement and collecting that information themselves. They knew by noon or one on the 14th, mm-hmm. this is a double homicide. I, I guess maybe he's just giving a, 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 a PC answer. I don't know, but it seems a little weird. The wording brought to the attention of the investigators. Well, again, we have zero evidence or zero confirmation that any eyewitness or surveillance was caught of a guy covered in blood. And I believe this individual would have been covered in blood. I think it would have been absolutely impossible for him not to be. And then I don't really understand this question. I'll read it, though, Captain. And if you uh, can figure it out, just uh, throw something at me and, and tell me what's up. Question. No matter how distant, do you have the man walking on the bridge videoed by Libby on any other video? Okay, I see what they're saying now. Do Do we have video of him doing anything else or is there any other video of this man i guess walking elsewhere or seen elsewhere his answer is this is close to an evidentiary information question and i prefer not to respond this is interesting because we we know his statement of however bridge guy left the area is all speculation it might be very good and very informed speculation but we can't say for certain how he left the area If you had other video of this guy, of Bridge Guy, on any type of surveillance footage or or anything that's in this question here, you'd think that would help them pinpoint that down a little better. I I have a hard time, though, believing that there's no other footage of this guy anywhere else. I I probably would lean more towards the the thought that there is video of this dude someplace else. They just don't know that it's him. Like if you have some bad, distant, grainy footage Mm -hmm. of of random people walking somewhere, you might be able to go, well, he might be in this footage, but we have six people, 10 people, 18 people in this footage that are all unidentified. Well, we do know about the bridge guy picture. It's coming from video that Libby took. The speculation at first was that it didn't come from her. Nobody knew that. A lot of people thought it came from like a trail cam or something. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's also why people are going, hey, well, if, if we thought the original picture came from a trail cam, there must be a bunch of trail cams out there. And did one of them pick up and take a picture of the murderer? Mm -hmm. Well, this goes to that same thought. Why have no other pictures from Libby's phone been released to the public? And he gives a similar answer. This is close to an evidentiary information question, and I prefer not to respond. But again, when he's interviewed in person, we get a a slightly different answer to a slightly similar question. And it was, look, we have additional video. We have additional audio. However, there's nothing, and I believe his exact words were something like, there's nothing earth shattering that would be on there that would help anybody in the public go, okay, well, now I know who this is. I think that echoes what something we've said before. We have to believe that they've provided us with probably the best portion of that video for us to look at. They've probably provided us with the best portion of that audio for us to hear. That's the best chance that the public can help to identify this guy or submit the right tip that will lead to an arrest in the Delphi case. All right, welcome back. Cheers, mates. You always make us feel so welcome there, Captain. Well, I just want to go back again. It's the crux of the case. You ask for a bunch of questions, 
all your answers are going to be, well, we can't share that information. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, a lot of cases don't get the spotlight that this one's getting. I, I'm so happy that four years later, we're still talking about it. We still care. We, we still want answers. We still want justice. And people are trying to do everything they can. It's, it's almost like, and here's my other issue. You collected the questions. You sat down and took the time to answer them. Why not just every question that you're going to answer is the ones that you put out to the public. The ones that you say, well, we can't answer that. We have, it's, there's evidence there and we can't release that. You don't need to print that. Well, I think you got to keep in mind we got two different entities at work here. We have the the newspaper who collected all the questions, decided which ones would be asked to the sheriff, submitted them to the sheriff, and then he's he's answering the questions back to the newspaper, and then they're the ones printing them. So they would have had hundreds of these questions, if right. not maybe a thousand or two, and they're the ones that are kind of curating, if you will, the questions that are submitted to the the sheriff. And I think in, you know, just to be I mean, journalistically maybe they're just trying responsible. To, right, they're trying to be transparent. Correct. So the next question is, why have you never released the FBI's suspect profile to the public? And Toby's answer is, it has been discussed with the FBI, but again, it is currently felt it is too close to the evidentiary element. Now, we talked earlier about what would I have done different or, or you or, or anybody else out there. Right. This is something I would pivot from. I would I would pivot to if you do have an FBI profile. Pivot. If you, if you have one and you think that it's good, that needs to be released. Pivot. That should be released to the public. I, I Well, I think the profile might might be more important than the actual sketch because I think a lot of the sketch is coming from that fit that video. And that is so grainy that I look the guys down the hill audio was cleaned up. And as an audio engineer, I would tell you that clip is completely dirty and that's cleaned up by people that are connected to the FBI. Mm-hmm. So I think the, these sketches, especially after four years have, done a lick of good other than maybe create some speculation on the internet if they would have released the profile with the sketch people would have started eliminating people right away and not sent in as many tips and maybe not sent you on as many wild goose chases are there regrets about not securing the morning heights cemetery as a possible part of the crime scene And then they go on to say, i.e. possible exit route of the killer or killers. His answer is at the time, it was uncertain exactly what the totality of the circumstances were. Yeah, I get that. And I, and I'm on his side. They didn't know exactly what they were dealing with. And uh, it's, it's hard to go back in time. You can't and and change certain aspects of your investigation. Question, do investigators believe the bridge photo and voice belong to the same person? And this is a question that keeps... Good question. It's a good question. It keeps recycling this question over and over again, though, throughout the the years here. And his simple answer is yes. Uh, We believe the bridge photo and voice belong to the same person. Right, which makes me believe that it's one perpetrator. Right, and we have Doug Carter from the... Indiana State Police, who said in the the famous press conference, the two-year press conference, he said, you know, the voices you hear, remember, before it was just down the hill. Right. And then it became guys down the hill. He specifically said, before releasing that audio, that the voice you are hearing is one person. Mm -hmm. The day the girls were found, how quickly were you personally on the scene? How quickly was the crime scene secured? How many police and emergency response individuals were physically present at the crime scene? What departments were represented at the scene? His answer, as I recall, a very short amount of time, less than an hour, by law enforcement immediately. I do not recall without referencing reports, mainly sheriff's office, 
Indiana State Police, and the FBI. Well, I think at one point there's a statement in the documentary. Again, it's a documentary, so it might not be factual, but they claimed that there was at least four crime scene technicians investigating the crime scene and basically saying that there was tons of evidence that they were able to collect at the crime scene. And I can't recall 100% captain, but I think that the person that gave that statement was from Delphi police department or Indiana state police. It was a member of law enforcement that said that, that there were four crime scene technicians right. on the scene. And that I think he said they worked the scene for about four days altogether. So yeah. a lot I mean, of time spent there. And you wouldn't spend that long of time at the crime scene if you weren't continually finding new pieces of evidence or just pieces of anything really, because right. you don't know what is evidence and what is just, it, what was just already there. Mm-hmm. I think that because the murders took place outdoors because the victims are found outdoors. And this is an area that, uh, while very remote where the bodies were found, this is also parts of this area are high traffic. As far as foot traffic goes, I think that that complicates things and that, that adds to the list of things that you collected during that time when you're, when you're trying to piece everything together. What you, what you do is you collect everything you can possibly find Mm-hmm. and then later determine if it, if it has anything to do with not, the, yeah. the crime at all. Now, when you say high foot traffic areas, the bridge? Well, uh, yes, yeah, so I would guess the uh, the Monin High Trail system itself. Um, the bridge, maybe, but uh, yeah, the, the other side of the bridge is not going to be have the same level of foot traffic. You know, and, and again, certainly where the girls were found, is not going to have nearly the amount of foot traffic as you would expect on the trail system itself. Yes, and and there was also some foot traffic. Some people, instead of taking the trails, they would follow the river line. So there would be some foot traffic along the river line. Yeah, and the, the other issue, too, becomes that you have such a big area to cover as far as the crime scene techs go. Right, because yes. we know that at least an article of clothing was found in the creek itself. Mm-hmm. The bodies were not found in the water. So, I mean, you can, and then the we know that the bridge guy was on the bridge and the victims were on the bridge. We know that they were dropped off at the trailhead and walked the trail system to get to the bridge. Mm-hmm. So you can see, if you close your eyes and try to imagine As you hear the words coming out of my mouth, you can see this crime scene just growing and growing and growing uh, very quickly for investigators. Well, and we also know that we have a a shoe that was found, and we know that her phone wasn't found at the, the, the crime scene. So you have to take those pieces of information and triangulate all of that together. Where was the phone found? That's not clear, but it's it's clear that it wasn't like connected to the the crime scene maybe it was on the other side of the river i'm not really for sure it's just the statement they made they found the phone because of it pinging off the towers when they found the bodies and when they found the phones were separate times so that is what leads me to believe that the phone was not in the same location as the bodies right that's why what i wanted to clarify because the whole place is a crime scene right So it found at the crime scene, just not right with the bodies is what what we believe. In the public domain, there have been descriptions of the crime scene, descriptions of items found, and the positioning of the bodies. Do you feel there was an excessive number of persons present once it was determined to be a crime scene? I guess the simplest form of this question would be, were there too many people involved in the search that they have contaminated the crime scene? And once you go from looking for two girls that are alive and well, or, or maybe injured or just lost to, you now know you have two murder victims. Mm -hmm. How quickly were you able to secure the scene to make sure that it wasn't trampled all over? And his answer is once secured by law enforcement as a crime scene, No, I would surmise that searchers did not immediately know what they had come upon. That's interesting Mm -hmm. because 
when we had the former prosecutor come out, and I, I think this is a little irresponsible, but whatever. I'm irresponsible myself. I'm, I'm, not, I'm no saint, Captain. But when the former prosecutor came out and said that there were signatures left by the killer at the crime scene and, and specifically where the bodies were found, mm-hmm. and he said that he, he would label that as three or four signatures, and then another person from law enforcement asked a very similar question prov- once provided with that information from the former prosecutor, pretty much confirmed that, that there would have been about three or four different signatures. Now, I've seen p- the public hears this and they go crazy. They go crazy trying to figure out what those signatures could be. And of course, a lot of people's minds go to something very bizarre that you would see in some not so great thriller movie out there. One of the things that that I saw that was speculated and and maybe continues to be to this day was that the killer wrote a word or words at several places in the crime scene. And one that gets a little difficult because they're outdoors. So where is he writing this? Did he bring things with him to leave, leave a note or more specifically, I've seen it discussed that it was one word in particular that was just written over and over again. And to me, that seems very, very much like a psychological thriller, Velveeta cheesy type movie Mm -hmm. thing here. And what we do have though, is we have the sheriff who's saying, look, law enforcement got there as soon as we could. Obviously the searchers found them first. But we got there as soon as we could, and as soon as we were there, it was a crime scene, and it was secured, and we pushed everybody out of the area. And he goes on to say that he would surmise that most of the searchers were not really aware of what they had come upon. The searchers coming upon two victims and not really understanding what they've come upon kind of contradicts the idea that there was some kind of display made of the crime scene. Yeah. I think that if, if you, they were able to see writing all over the place, one, one you'd have to, if if there was writing the obvious spot that it would be, would be on the victims or their clothing because Mm -hmm. you're outdoor. I think it's, it's actually very telling that, that whatever these signatures are, probably most of the people in that search party would not recognize this type of stuff to be quote unquote, a signature. Right. And like you said, there's no, there probably is not some bizarre display going on at the crime scene either. If, if we're to believe these words to be fact, then what that means to me is that someone probably spotted a body Mm -hmm. and then very quickly told people not to, I'm going to walk a little bit closer to confirm that I'm seeing what I think I'm seeing. And we're calling it in. We're not, we're not venturing into this area. Well, based on the HLN documentary, they were saying a searcher actually spotted them by zooming in, you know, like they were looking through their phone and zooming in on the camera. Mm -hmm. So maybe they spotted them from a distance so they wouldn't be able to see the signatures. Also, if you're around the creek bed, you wouldn't be tall enough to see over the brush to actually see the victims because they're kind of in a dip. Correct. And often in these search parties, you know, it's still very early on that they're looking for these girls. They're looking for them on the second day when they're found less than 24 hours after they went missing. Mm -hmm. So you might have a, a different speech that is given, but often there are, you know, Everyone's instructed usually in these situations to, if you see this, then, then behave this way. If you see this behave this way. Mm -hmm. And often, especially when they believe that they're looking for a victim or for evidence, which is not what they would have believed at the time, they would be instructed to not approach anything. If you, as a searcher, if you see this, do not approach the scene, do not approach this item or this article you have said you recognize the voice on the video. This is, this is probably the most scary slash haunting portion of these questions. You have said you recognize the voice on the video. Do you recognize it as a jail inmate 
other law enforcement team or person you know outside your employment sphere. And Lesson B says, I still have not been able to pin it down in my 30 plus year career or even as with most of us, meaning law enforcement, we have heard certain voices, but have difficulty in recalling exactly who it is. Well, a couple of thoughts right away is when they're asking the parents about what they hear or did they recognize the voice, how they point out how calm the individual is. And I never really thought about the energy that the person was using, that this perpetrator was using. But when you listen back to it, the energy is very calm. And I really like the idea of people pointing out when he says, you guys down the hill, it's not a command. It's not angry. It's very authority figure or parental figure. And I think that's very important. When I hear guys down the hill and exactly the the mannerism and the tone, you're right. It's very quick and to the point and instructional. At the same time, I, to me, my mind jumps to somebody that's used to directing a a group of, of children or a group of young adults Mm -hmm. and my mind immediately jumps to teacher. And I don't know why captain, please don't anybody stone me to death in the, in the center of town here, but my mind jumps to gym teacher. I don't know why that's always like popped in my head of, of. I, I think it's really the tone and the mannerism of something that's kind of a laid back, quick to the point and instructional guys down the hill. Yeah. Quick to the point, point, no fake and cooking MCs like a pound of bacon. Um, I agree with you, Jim teacher, look into that aspect, but I think you can broaden her, your, your horizons a little bit. Somebody that might have coached little mm-hmm. league baseball. What I would like to know, because the girls were out of school that day and that's why they were out on the trail to begin with. And I do not want emails from people that look, we got a lot of people that are teachers in our audience and and our listeners. A lot of them are fantastic teachers. I only want to know specifically to that, that school system, because you know, captain, everything changes from area to area. Right. And even on the calendar year for a school, in particular, but for that direct community and that direct school system, I would love to know because the girls were off of school that day, were the teachers off as well? Or was that a day where the teachers would have been working in some capacity, but without students? Next question. The families of the Delphi victims have appeared on countless shows and internet videos for interviews. Libby's grandfather, Mike Patty stated he called cop buddies and asked if they could ping Libby's phone. Were you or one of your deputies the cop buddies he called? Some of you will remember that when the girls were missing, Mike Patty at some point, I think when we, again, I'd have to refer to our old episodes, but I think we put this on our timeline like in the 6 o'clock hour Mm -hmm. of the day that they were missing. Could you... Could you look into their phones? And Lesbian's answer is, I would suggest he was referring to someone in law enforcement. And it could have been even dispatch initially. The ultimate decision was a law enforcement decision. So I think what Tobe Lesbian is saying here is just because it's a cop buddy doesn't mean that it has to be somebody at his department that right. Mike Patty was reaching out to. Libby's grandmother, Becky Patty with whom she lived and who is the mother of her biological father, Derek German, stated during an interview there were countless cars at the trails that day, not all of them looking for the girls. Did the Patty family post on social media the girls were missing before contacting the sheriff's department? This is interesting because I would like to a better answer here. It's, I do not recall, but I know we were not immediately contacted because the family did not suspect anything negative and were simply conducting their own search. Right. So you're like me, what I'd like to know, and somebody from the community probably could let me know, was this information distributed through Facebook and were people reposting this 
or sharing this with uh, people in the community on social media? From my understanding, a couple things happened. One, I believe that they were on the night news. Now, some areas that's 11 o'clock or 10 p.m. I believe they were on the nighttime news with, hey, we got a couple missing girls and we're still out here looking for them. Mike Patty in particular is is interviewed briefly in that statement that is released to the public via the news. I do believe that Mike Patty's family, somebody in the family did put something on Facebook kind of calling to action people to come help look for the girl. So this, this would be an easy way to get that information out to all of your friends and family. Hey, if you're available, can you come and help us look for these girls? We don't, we don't think anything terrible has happened here. We just, we know that they were dropped off near the, uh, Mon and high bridge and the trail system there. We got a lot of ground to cover. It's getting dark. It's getting late. It's getting cold all hands on deck. We need some people to help us look for these girls. So I don't know exactly what was sent out, but we have statements by the family that they were using those methods to try to rally some troops into helping them look. And just so we're clear, do you remember what time they found the bodies? Well, it was right around noon the next day. And do you know what time the search started that day on the 14th? I believe it was at 6 a.m. Next question is, who notified Anna Williams that her child, Abby, was missing, and when did that notification take place? His answer is, I would have to reference earlier reported information. So we don't really get an answer there. Question, it has been stated in a press conference that, quote, it was all over by 3.30 on February 13th, end quote. This statement was based on what information? His answer evidence. I do not recall a specific time though, but rather a timeline. This is curious to me because it doesn't really answer the question 100%. It was all over by 3:30 on February 13th. I see our timeline that we've put together and I've seen everything else that's been brought up in this case and it does in fact look to me like this is very likely the situation that they were abducted and killed in the same area in a very short period of time. We do know from statements from law enforcement and interviews and the documentary, the bodies were found less than a quarter of a mile away from where the bridge ended. Has it been determined the girls were killed where they were found? Again, this is a question that keeps kind of recycling through over the years answer yes based on information known yes question why did you and the prosecutor choose to do an interview with headline news hln yet isp indiana state police said there would not be a press conference this year again who is leading the case the state police the county sheriff fbi or the county prosecutor you can see the confusion for the public and the mixed signals, so to speak. Expand on who runs what parts of the investigation, who determines when there's a press conference. This is an interesting answer. Mm -hmm. In a general sense, the leading agency is the agency who routinely patrols and responds to calls for police services in a given jurisdiction. So in this case, in his professional opinion... The crime occurred in the county of Carroll County. So they are considered to be the lead agency, his sheriff's department. The state police, the FBI, the prosecutor's office, and the investigators from the prosecutor's office and other agencies are considered assistant agencies coming on board to assist the Carroll County Sheriff's Department. He does go on to say, being a small agency, we frequently rely on larger agencies who have many more resources to help with investigations. This is commonplace throughout the United States. Smaller agencies will sometimes relinquish an investigation to a larger assisting agency, such as the state police. But I feel strongly that since this crime occurred in the county, I feel we are the lead, but with many partners. Additionally, when decisions 
which we feel are major to the case are being looked at. Our investigative partners are consulted like a huge think tank. And we all reach a decision which we all agree upon. Next question. The public has heard for four years the investigation is one puzzle piece from being solved. What is that one piece specifically? Is it a name? Is it John Doe told me he killed the kids? Or are you looking for confirmation of what you know? John Doe was not at work. He has a blue jacket. He cut his hair on February 14th. Or I saw a guy with a bloody jacket at 4 p.m. on February 13th at the gas station. You are not giving the public a lot to work with, yet no arrest in four years. Aren't you worried about more victims? Is the suspect dead or incarcerated? So that is why no press conference or additional information is being released. His answer is the person specifically responsible for Abby and Libby's death. Our team of trained, experienced, and professional investigators will know that one piece when they see it. I think that's a very clever answer by Mr. Lesenby there. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think he's right. If, if they know more than we know, and they're working this case as much as they're telling us that they are, that one piece, when they have it, they'll, they'll recognize it immediately, and they will act on that information as soon as it's presented to them. I get the feeling that they know who it is or have a good idea of who it is. I think they've got a lot of tips. They've ruled, I think, people out. They've had a lot of people that the true crime community has said, oh, we need to look into this guy. This guy just created this murder. This guy is a rapist. This guy is a pedo in the area. Well, all their DNA would be on file. I believe they have some form of DNA, and it's not matching those people, but also, these people were not matching the signatures, the profile, other things. I think they have a small list of people, maybe. If it's not just one that they're focused on, it's a small list. And I think some of them, I keep hearing from Kelsey that this will be solved one day. And she said in the last interview I listened to her, she said something to the, the point of that this individual will slip up. And I also kind of heard that. You, you almost get that feeling. I don't know if it was said directly like that in the documentary, but you get that feeling from law enforcement too. And so that makes me wonder if they're like, well, if it's not one person that they have a small list of people and they're waiting for something to slip up. I think based off of information that we currently have, where we have the sheriff saying we have DNA, we just don't know if it belongs to the killer or not. We have fingerprints. We don't know if they belong to the killer or not. What that would tell me is that you can't really clear anybody 100% unless they have a rock solid alibi for the time in question. Right. And based off of evidence there, other than, than an alibi, they're not able to clear some of these people or potential suspects. However, you're exactly right, Captain. What they're going to do, even though they cannot clear a specific person, they will prioritize these individuals and they will put some on a high priority list and some on a lower priority list because the people on the lower priority list, they may have compared things with that individual and things at the crime scene and such and said, you know what, we can't clear him, but he's not a high priority for us. Because of A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. He doesn't fit exactly what we're looking for because of A, B, and C. Maybe it is his DNA doesn't match any that we found. Maybe it is that his fingerprints do not match any that were found. And even if we don't know if we have either of these things of the killer, we do suspect that we would find this person's fingerprints and or their DNA at the scene, and, and we don't. So we make them a low-priority suspect. I think the problem with the signatures is we got to take that and look to it for future evidence because look this this guy let's say he is a serial killer there's very likely that these might be his first two murder victims mm -hmm. he may have committed some other crimes along the way they usually ramp up to this but if these were his first two murders 
then these signatures at the murder scene may not be signatures that would be present at, at any of the other crimes he ever committed or thought about committing. And so these signatures are more something that we would use for a future murder that, Oh, if you saw these three or four signatures, then law enforcement might believe that it's the same guy. I do like that statement by, by them saying those same words that I just used. If, if law enforcement recognize these same three or four signatures at a future murder, we would probably recognize immediately that it's the same guy. That makes me believe that these have to be fairly specific signatures. Yeah. Now signatures themselves can be very simplistic. They don't have to be these, you know, crazy wild things. It could be something posing the bodies is a signature. Okay. Posing the bodies could be mean something as little as they face them in the same direction or laid the victims out. So, and put their feet together and then their arms over top of their chest. It doesn't have to be anything grandiose. Like you would see in Hannibal Lecter, the TV show. It it's, it could be something as simple as they were posed in that manner. They were both placed face down and the, the detectives have determined that this was, they didn't fall that way that he chose to manipulate the crime scene and place them that way. And I don't want to get too much into the signature aspect of it because these are child victims and, and I, I have some very strong suspicions of what I believe those signatures to be. And maybe we'll talk about that sometime on off the record or another show. But, um, the thing I keep going back to captain is what Doug Carter says when he's speaking directly to the killer around the two year anniversary. When he says, I can promise you that those two girls are not in the same way that you left them that day. Meaning I, I feel like he manipulated the crime scene specifically the, the victim's bodies in yeah. some way. And that's Doug Carter. And he says that at probably one of the most emotional parts of his press conference. And I think that's his way of saying whatever image you have of your victims in your head, that's burned into your brain of how you left them that day and the things you chose to do with the victims and the ways that you chose to manipulate the crime scene. None of that exists anymore. That those victims are not the same way that you left them. They're not your victims anymore. You don't hold any kind of power over, over them or whatever degrading, actions you took that no longer exist you've not won we we will find you yeah which is interesting because they're saying that the crime was sexual but they're not saying if there was assault or rape we would assume if there was we'd have some kind of semen dna but they're saying this is about power and about control and that was said in the the two-year press conference so by letting them know that this is not your crime scene anymore, you don't have control over this, we, we gave the victims back the power. Next question. Can you elaborate about your reference to this case as having a twist that you have never seen before? Is it something more than Libby's audio recording and videotaping of their assailant or assailants? And his answer is, one of the main twists is that Carroll County has had a high success rate of finding missing persons. For this case to have the initial outcome was nothing we, even as seasoned veterans, experienced. Thanks so much for joining us here in the garage. Do not hesitate if you have a tip, no matter how small you think it is. Please call 844-459-5786. And please join us back here in the garage tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't live.